everybody for coming to the Aaron Torres podcast YouTube page. If you could do me a quick favor, see that little subscribe button at the bottom of your screen, go ahead, click that subscribe button really does help our channel grow, our audience grow. And I really do appreciate it more than, you know, so click that subscribe button, appreciate your support. Now here's the video that you came here for. I want to go ahead and get back to the topic of the day in all of sports, I would argue, or at least in college football, that is the wild news out of Texas A&M that Jimbo Fisher was in fact fired on Sunday morning. Now, Sunday morning, I did a reaction video really kind of breaking down all the big kind of narratives, why it happened now, how it happened. Yes, Jimbo Fisher is going to be paid the $76 million to see you later to get out the door. But what I want to do now is switch gears and really kind of dive into the coaching candidates who are realistic guys for this job, who are not. Before we, we get started, by the way, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, the Aaron Torres Pod YouTube channel, the Aaron Torres Pod. I have a feeling we're basically going to be talking this, this topic pretty much every day over the next couple of weeks. It's going to get crazy. It's going to get hectic. We're going to have you covered wall to wall. So make sure to subscribe. As we dive into the candidates, though, let me even start by saying this. You know, I, so I live on the West Coast. I, I host Fox Sports Radio late into the night. On Saturdays, we do the national postgame show. So I go to bed super late on Saturdays, and I woke up Sunday to this news. I was not awake when this news happened, okay? And what, why I bring that up, not to tell you my personal schedule, but I bring it up because when I first saw the news, my immediate assumption is, well, they're doing it now. There must be a plan in place. They must have a guy that they know is going to say yes so that come the end of the regular season, there is a guy in place that first Sunday immediately once the season ends. I bring it up because I spent most of Sunday morning and early afternoon on the phones. And what I can tell you is my understanding of what is going on at Texas A&M before we even get to the candidates. I don't think Texas A&M has a clear cut plan and vision of what the next step is. I think most of the, the, the big money boosters basically decided we can't keep going on like this, but I, I, I assumed when I saw this news, well, they must have a guy, they must know one or two guys that they know will say yes, if they pursue them. I don't get the sense that that is the case at all. And I really get the sense that they are kind of going into this blind, really going in with open eyes to kind of get the best candidate possible. But if you think that they know who they they, they want, I, I don't believe that is the case right now. So let's dive into some candidates, realistic and not. Uh, and I want to start with the name that is on the tip of everybody's tongue, but I don't want to spoil it for anybody. I, I, I don't really see him as a legitimate candidate. That is the head coach at Oregon. Dan Lanning. Dan Lanning has done an incredible job. Oregon is now nine and one, obviously and very much in the thick of the college football playoff race. More importantly to me, I, I think he is the new age, just recruiting rock star of college football. Okay. I know people who cover that Oregon team and they say, look, Mario Cristobal, we thought was the best we had ever seen. Dan Lanning has taken it to another level has a plan with the portal, has a plan with grad transfers, has a plan with uh, high school recruits, has a plan with high school undergrads. I mean, you go you, you go to an Oregon game, you're seeing, uh, you know, hundreds of recruits in some cases, 2024, 2025, 2026, 20, you know, he just has a blueprint in place. So he is new age. I just don't know that this is the job that he is going to leave for. He's very well compensated at Oregon. He got a very nice raise last year when Auburn opened. And as many other people have reported, he's got a $20 million buyout. Beyond that, you know, because money is of no issue to Texas A&M, obviously. Um, I also think it's kind of worth noting, this is not a knock Texas A&M. I think Oregon in the new wave of college football kind of might be a better job. Because when you look at Oregon, where they are right now as they head to the Big Ten, I think they are ready to step into the Big Ten and compete at the top of that conference right away. Not saying they're definitively better than Michigan or Ohio State going into next year. But you look at everybody else in that league. I watched Penn State against Michigan. Penn State ain't in the same stratosphere as, as Oregon. Uh, certainly not Nebraska, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan State, whoever they end up getting. So you look at Oregon, they're just very nicely positioned going forward. Now, obviously, by the way, they're, they're coming with USC. They're coming with Washington, two good programs, UCLA, a good program as well. But I just think Oregon is very nicely set up in the new age of the uh, of the Big Ten. And you look at Texas A&M and the SEC. I think they are ready to compete at the highest level. They're willing to spend. But so is Alabama. So is Georgia. So is Texas. So is Oklahoma. So if I'm Dan Lanning, you know, I, I, I might not answer my AD's calls for a day or two to try to get a little bit of a raise. 
but I think he's in the spot that he should be. I find it very hard to believe that he would leave Tex- for Texas A&M. Let's kind of keep it going. You know, another name that is just absolutely fascinating. I thought we were done talking about this guy, but how about Lane Kiffin? First of all, Lane Kiffin, it would be so ironic and so funny if Lane Kiffin ended up being the head coach at Texas A&M because of the fact that he basically spent the last three years poking Jimbo Fisher. Long before Nick Saban went after Jimbo Fisher for all the NIL stuff, it was it was Lane Kiffin basically saying, uh, you know, they need a, a salary cap over there at A&M. Uh, you know, they, they're out of control, whatever. And then even the last couple weeks in the lead up to their game last Saturday, um, you know, Lane Kiffin was still kind of making cracks and comments and whatever was referencing the fact that that might be the best defensive line he's ever seen in college football. They have an NFL defensive line. So if after years and years and years of mocking Jimbo Fisher to then step in and replace him, that would be something to see. Now, on the one hand, Lane Kiffin, like everybody else, very well compensated, nine plus million dollars a year. It's interesting. We don't actually know his buyout. If you remember, if you go back to last year, another guy that was a candidate at Auburn, um, Mississippi state law says you can't sign beyond a four-year contract as a state employee. So somehow they did it through the, the, the university, the private part of the university. I don't even fully understand, but I bring it up because that was how they got around Mississippi law to give Lane Kiffin a long-term contract. What I will say about Lane Kiffin, this job opens up at a very interesting time because they're coming off the loss to Georgia. And I think you can see as good as Lane Kiffin is, as good of a schematics guy as he is, when they played Georgia on Saturday night, and obviously Alabama earlier this year, talent-wise, they, they're they not even close. And that's not a knock on the guys at Ole Miss. But you do wonder, if you're Lane Kiffin, did you look around on Saturday night and say, I, I game-planned everything, I planned everything, I schemed everything, and Georgia's just got so many dudes on this roster. And you do wonder, can you put together that kind of roster at Ole Miss? So I don't think Lane Kiffin is going to be at Ole Miss forever. He's obviously been speculated to one day replace Nick Saban at Alabama. Don't necessarily see him as a candidate for this job, but one, if there's a way to get out of that contract at Ole Miss, and two, you do wonder if he kind of realizes, I've probably hit a ceiling at Ole Miss. We were going to win 10 games this year. We won 10 games two years ago, but it's hard to imagine it getting any better than it is right now. I'll be blunt. I find it hard for him to leave, but I think as weird as it sounds, I think it's more likely that he would leave now than he would have 24 hours ago. Let's go back to the Pac-12. Seen a lot of Kalen DeBoer talk. Kalen DeBoer, of course, the head coach at Washington, and they're in the midst of just an unbelievable season. 10-0, first Pac-12 team since 2014, first time time in about a decade to start the year 10-0. And and they're basically in position to, to potentially go to the college football playoff. Um, they still have uh, Oregon State this weekend, then Washington State to close the regular season. But even if you lose one, you're very likely going to the Pac-12 championship game, knowing that you win the Pac-12 championship game, you're in. So probably minimum of two losses, uh, or you're going to need two losses, excuse me, to not go to the college football playoff. I guess in theory, if you lose to Oregon, whatever, you get the point. They're in great shape. That's the only point I'm trying to make. At the same time, Texas A&M, listen, the one thing I will say about Kalen DeBoer right now, financially, he is way behind the rest of the uh, of major college football. He's making $4.3 million this year. That is amazing money for me and pretty much anybody watching this video. But for every but for a major college football coach, that is nothing. And so obviously Washington, they got a new AD. Their previous AD, Jen Cohen, actually just left for USC. Um, and the new AD has said, basically, it's my priority to make sure that Kalen DeBoer feels home here for a very long time. Uh, my hunch is that he's from the Pacific Northwest. You know, he's from South Dakota. That's not really the Pacific Northwest, but he's from that area of the country, began his coaching career there. I don't necessarily think that he's desperate to get to the SEC, but listen, you get offered four, th- you're getting, you're making four, three, your salary gets tripled. You probably got to go ahead and listen. And I don't know if that's quite the going rate for Kalen DeBoer, but my guess is it's probably around there. So my hunch is no, but as they say, money talks, I could see the scenario where he's at least interested. Let's keep it going. I think the most interesting guy on this list is Mike Elko. Okay. So Mike Elko is the Duke head coach. And I think most people know, but the job he had before he was at Duke was as the Texas A&M defensive coordinator. And it's worth noting, like he recruited a lot of these guys on on this roster. I remember when he left for Duke, 
talking to people at Texas A&M, like it was right before national sign day. It's like, Oh my God, we're going to lose all these guys. Now they did it. They were fine, whatever. But Mike Elko is that dude. Great defensive mind. The defense was always elite when he was the head coach. And then beyond that, a guy that the players love and respect and is really well respected in college football circles. By the way, he's a heck of a coach too, right? Nine wins last year at Duke. This year they're six and four. But so many of those uh law so much so much of it has come as they've been banged up. Riley Leonard, their star quarterback, is hurt. When they were fully healthy, they did beat Clemson. Uh, they took care of business against a bunch of other teams. They played right down to the wire against Notre Dame when when Riley Leonard was hurt. And so you look at Mike Elko, he's doing unbelievable work at Duke. Now the question becomes, does he, I think the question is this, he's clearly not going to stay at Duke forever. I I don't think he will, but is Texas A&M the job? Now on the one hand, ties to the school. On one hand, uh, he recruited a lot of those players. Those players love him. And I think if you could get him, if you're Texas A&M, you have to jump at that opportunity. The problem is you hear mixed things about how interested is he really? He's a Jersey guy. You know, he spent time all over Midwest, Southeast, Southwest, whatever, uh, from Jersey was at Notre Dame before Texas A&M. And I don't know if he, if if that's really the job that he wants, that he desires, if he's going to leave Duke, the counter to that is like, we're seeing it at Duke right now. He's doing as good of a coaching job as you possibly can. And despite it, Duke is sitting there at six and four overall. Okay. Duke's been banged up over the last couple of weeks. Duke is in a situation where, um, you know, they just, they, they've just lost too many guys and now they've lost three of four, uh, all three to ranked teams, North Carolina, Louisville, and Florida state. And you just wonder like, has he already hit the ceiling at Duke? Like, I think that's an important question. Nine wins last year, this year, you looked at the schedule, you saw Florida state, you saw Clemson, you said, okay, that's not easy. Notre Dame as well. But when a Louisville gets it rolling under Jeff Brom, when a Mac Brown has it rolling at North Carolina, There's just so many teams that are so much better built to have success. Be curious if this is actually the guy that ends up getting the job. I think he's a guy that at least listens. There's obviously a relationship with Ross Bjork. Remember Ross Bjork, the AD, he was not the guy that hired Jimbo Fisher. He was the guy that gave him that extension. Curious to see if you can convince him to take that job. Keep going with a couple other candidates. Listen, uh, you know, Lance Leipold is kind of an interesting name. I think everybody knows, but he is the head coach at Kansas uh, 59 years old, just a great program builder, a guy, of course, that won multiple national championships at Wisconsin, Whitewater, the D3 power that he turned it into, goes to Buffalo, has success. And the thing he's doing at Kansas, in my mind, is unbelievable, okay? Remember, Kansas, when he took over, he took over Kansas after spring practice two years ago. So Les Miles gets fired in May of 2021. Lance Leipold gets the job in May of 2021 after spring practice. Many of his best players have left 2021. They have success last year. They make a bowl game. And then obviously this year, uh, even though they did lose over the weekend, they are playing really good football right now. Um, And Lance Leipold is the reason why seven and three overall for the Jayhawks, even after he lost to Texas tech this week problem for Lance Leipold, a couple things. One, he was linked to Michigan state last week and he just said, no, I'm not interested, not going. No, thank you. This is the, he literally said on the radio, this is the only interview I'm doing this week. It's for this right here, not for any coaching jobs. No, nothing. So I think there's that element to it. I think the other thing, he's 59 years old. And I guess if, if, you know, on on the one hand, obviously can have a quick turnaround. He just did it at Kansas. On the other hand, you know, that's not a guy that's going to be there for, you know, the, the very, very, very long-term future. So an interesting name there, but he's kind of already kind of implied that, um, you know, he doesn't really totally have interest in, in, in going anywhere else. I think that's probably a long shot. Another guy that I heard kind of tied to Michigan State early, not so much of late, Chris Kleiman at Kansas State. To me, this is an interesting one. Another guy like Lance Leipold started at the lower levels at, uh, he ended up, uh, he was at North Dakota state, excuse me, leads them to multiple national championships at the FCS level and has come to Kansas state and been really, really, really good. And that's what I like about a guy like him, like Leipold builder, developer, talent guy, you know, like, like just checks all the boxes. And you look at Kansas state last year. Remember Kansas state was actually the team that won the big 12. Now TCU played for the national championship, but they got in as an at-large after Kansas State beat them in the Big 12 championship game. Ten wins last season. They're 7-3 and three right now, closing in on another potential 10-win season. This is a really, really good coach in Chris Kleiman. 
Don't know if he'd leave, but listen, again, you know, this, this feels like one where in theory you could probably get him to at least listen. Um, you know, you look at his salary, uh, he's making about five and a half a year. So it's going to be a little bit harder to get him out, but five and a half relative to what most people in the sec are making is chump change. My guess is, um, my guess is he's a guy that would listen kind of in that Midwest ish area has ties. And I do wonder what the ceiling is at Kansas state. Now I think you could look at it as one of two ways on the one hand, big 12 next year with no Texas and Oklahoma, the pathway to that college football playoff probably becomes much easier for them in the 12 team era. The counter to that is once you get there, are you going to have the dudes? We saw it last week, last year, excuse me, against Alabama in the sugar bowl. You might be able to win the big 12 in a year where Texas and Oklahoma are down previously. Again, they'll be gone. They weren't even the same stratosphere as, as, as Alabama in that, that uh, conference championship game. So my hunch is that's a guy that would listen. That's a guy that would take your call. That's a guy that I would call if I was Texas A&M. We'll see what happens from there. A couple other names really quick because I know we're going long. Um, you know, one that that really intrigues me um, is, uh, is uh, excuse me, is uh, Jeff Trailer over at UTSA. Deep Texas ties, former Texas high school coach, all that good stuff. I'm not going to go on and on on this guy, but he's 55 years old. He's been around the block. He's had success at multiple levels. And of course, most recently at UTSA, he has built a juggernaut. 12 and 2 in 2021, 11 and 3 last year, 7 and 3 this this current season. Um, and obviously knows the landscape. And, and again, it's it's the same kind of blueprint as all these other guys. Knows the landscape, knows these coach, knows whatever. Uh, be, keep an eye on him. I think he's kind of a bottom of the rung, worst case scenario guy, but I could see him getting a call really quickly. Two others' names. One, Cliff Kingsbury. Listen, he, I don't personally buy into the Cliff Kingsbury narrative. Remember, he was actually the offensive coordinator at Texas A&M when Johnny Manziel was there. That's how he ended up getting the Texas Tech job. I've seen Cliff Kingsbury at the power conference level. It wasn't pretty. Wouldn't be my call, but he is a former NFL head coach. And the one thing I will say, after years of that boring Jimbo Fisher offense, at least you get a little something with him. So we'll see if that ends up happening. I I, I don't, you know, I wouldn't hire him, but, but he's clearly got a good agent because he gets fired at Texas Tech, then gets an NFL head coaching job after that. Now he's at USC kind of chilling. So we'll see what happens there. Last name. I'm going to pause for effect. I threw my shoulders back. I think we got to have a quick conversation about Urban Meyer. And this might be a larger picture conversation. Uh, let me just say this about Urban Meyer, okay? A couple things. One, the man is going to coach again. The man is, old, he just turned 59 years old a few months ago. And when I look at the, the, the track record of him, think about it. Nick Saban's 72. Uh, Brian Kelly is 60 plus. Jim Harbaugh is about to turn 60 years old. All of these guys, to some degree, are having success at the highest level. 60 years old is not that old. And I'm sorry, I don't believe that Urban Meyer is going to let the Jacksonville Jaguars be the final chapter of his coaching career. I believe he wants one more shot. I believe it is going to have to be at a school that wants to win at the highest level because it's kind of one of those things. He's not going to be the right fit at a lot of places. But at Texas A&M, they want to win so bad that I don't know how he isn't a candidate. He will win. It's funny. I saw some Texas A&M fans. He's not motivated anymore. I disagree with that. He's motivated by wins and losses. He's made all his, you know, he had made enough money to retire forever after Florida, but came back to coach Ohio State, came back to coach the Jacksonville Jaguars. So to me, like the guy wants to coach. Now, Texas A&M, they would have to ask themselves a tough question. Is he going to win at the highest level? He's not going to be there very long. He has left everywhere under a cloud of just, you know, people are not very happy with him, but he will win. He will win. Now, the question is, you know, obviously, uh, oh, when he was at Ohio State, the competition wasn't great. The SEC next year is going to be a bear. Uh, but I think you got to at least call Urban Meyer and talk to him. Um, like I said, maybe we do a deeper dive on that. I don't think he's done coaching. And so if he's not done coaching, if he's available, you got to make a call because, as I said, I think somebody's going to hire him at some point. I think it'd be a mistake if you didn't hire him. Let me know what you think of this video. Let me know of who you want as the next head coach at Texas A&M. Go ahead, drop that in the comment section. Also, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the Aaron Torres Pod YouTube channel because, as I said, we'll be talking a lot of Texas A&M these next few weeks.